It was my first time in New York, and I was appalled. This place is filthy. <laughs> Cinema, money, parties. It was outrageous. People came because the cameras were running. They thought they could become famous. At the center of it is the exploding art world. It opened your eyes to a lot of possibilities. We started getting a following, but a lot of radio stations wouldn't play our stuff. The sound, not only was it new, but it was radically different. We were studying natural harmonics. Shiny, shiny. Lowe's music was very heavy. Everything he does in that craggly voice of his resonated. That weirdness. It shouldn't have existed in this space. His music sounded like nothing else. And all of a sudden, it would stop like that, and the audience would be dead silent. The Velvet Underground had hypnotized them. Lou always was very clear that there's no difference between being a writer of the book and a writer of lyrics. The artist is not with society. He's different. I was interested in communicating to people who were on the outside. They were going to blaze a trail, which eventually they did. Good evening. We're your local Velvet Underground. Make sure I can record. Okay. I, hi, Ed. I'm from, uh, yeah, I'm from the city. I was actually, we did um, a, a nice long interview. I just looked it up uh, about four years ago in June of 2018, and I came to your studio. Oh, really? Yeah, we had a really long conversation. I showed what, 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 About what? I think about it was very general, in fact. I mean, you know, I, I, I thought I'd come in and, and, and pick your brain about your career and your you know, if, uh, and then you started getting very philosophical or ah. into, the, into the, you know, uh, uh, what's the expression into the weeds, I guess, or, oh, and right. I'm like, oh my God, I am in over my head. I just, oh, no, no, no. No, if you no. talk to me long enough, that happens, you know, <laughs> uh, but that's, yeah, but there's, that's in a way for, I think some, uh, some population of people that's, the 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 prize you know that's what they want especially if they're a cinematographer you know right 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 anyway right. i think it was not long after your conversation with storaro i want to say but oh is that possible yeah that could be yeah we did something up at the new york film festival that's right and i was there oh yeah right oh yeah it was that age old you know conversation about digital versus you know, a celluloid or film. And then your feeling was, well, why is it if and, or one or the other? Why can't an, uh, someone choose whatever medium right. they feel works best for them? Right, right. Not everything should look the same, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Right, exactly. So how are you? I'm hanging in there. You know, it's so great. The New York Film Festival um, showed in the revivals Mississippi Masala that I did with Mira Nair. Oh, like, amazing. And it was a criterion, did a new color correction with me. And then uh, I did a film with Lou Reed and John Cale the last We're time. We're going to talk about that. songs for Drella. Yeah, yeah. So I found the negative and the original sound mix out of Warner Brothers that was lost. Mm. And, that, and that came out spectacular. And it's a great companion piece with the Velvet Underground because now you see Fun. them in performance like really the last time. 
They did play together in a reunion. I in know France at I think Cartier, but but that was yeah that was a new material. This was the last time they were together, and it also brings in Andy and his their relationship to him. I want to so. say just for people listening, Ed, you right that was shot in 1990 right. uh, at BAM. Yes, at Bam. at Bam, and uh, you uh, shot this live the live uh, performance of Songs for Drella, which you just explained was their love letter right. or whatever for to Andy, who had died a few years earlier, of course. Um, and um, well, what was also interesting about it for me, and looking at it now. It's not your traditional concert film because Lou said to me, I don't want the camera between me and the performance uh, and between me and the audience. Right. And people have come to see this, you know, presentation, this play, this rock opera, so to speak. Right. And so I said to him, well, can I shoot the rehearsals just dressing what the you're going to be in your performance and I'll shoot one night of the performance, but the cameras will be out of sight. They'll be off the stage. So that gave me an incredible ability to have intimacy with them. And I could set up dolly tracks for and moves for each song and change the rendition of how the colors would look. And this gave me a great intimacy. And then the point of view of the cameras were really the between them, so it almost becomes a documentation okay. of their relationship through the music. And well, that's so the only relationship they had. Yeah, <laughs> from what I understand. But what's great about it is now looking at it is when an audience sees this performance, it's like they're the first audience because yeah. there's no audience in it. Right. There's no reverses for looking back. You just you're in the experience of what that performance is. That's a good point. And I, I misspoke in the sense that it was, but that's interesting. So can I ask you one thing? You were probably there for the live, at least one of the live shows, I'm gonna guess. Yeah. Did, did, did they um use, I mean, they were referring to it's I I mean it was so lyric driven. Um, wow. Some of those songs, and I'm just wondering if they, if if it was like memorized for the audience. I mean, I, I it doesn't make a difference. I was just curious. I wondered if they used like if they had their cheat sheets and, you know. Oh um, no! I mean, I mean the, 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 like any musician, they, they had the lyrics of the songs, but the lyrics, came, many of the lyrics came out of the diary of of Andy. That they took a lot of ideas out of his diary. Sure. But also, it became a memorial, right. it became a confessional, right. it became a dirge. It had all these layers in this performance. Uh, what the, the words, and also there's an evolution. It starts with small town and ends up, hello, it's me. You go through the whole life of Annie, his disappointments, his fears, the relationship he had to John, to Lou. So it's a very honest, open kind of confessional through the music. And that's but, what I found. But for me, as a just a viewer, potential fan, let's say, of watching, I saw John Cale looking at Lou a lot, referring to him. But Lou, I look, he looked down. He didn't, he never except for maybe one or two moments. And of course, I don't know what isn't there that you no, didn't include I, in the edit. Lou they seem to be music, but they, there was an interplay, but and that that's. You're not helping Ed. We're supposed to get, we're supposed to, you know, throw uh, <laughs> like gossip and I'm kidding, but oh. I know that they, they had been estranged. This brought the death, Andy's death, which of course was a uh, unexpected was, um, uh, you know, something that brought them back together for their songs for Drella, you got it. And then they they kind of fell out again, although they did reunite again and uh, probably at the French uh, event you were referring to. Right. And then that was it. Right. right. They never performed again, ever again. Right. Because they, they right. did not, they couldn't, they couldn't get along. Right. Well, look, I, it's, I, people have asked me, 
it's very hard. I had a great relationship with both of them. I, well, and, you're an easygoing man. I, uh, but I, once I, we, we kind of came to terms like I wasn't going to have cameras between them and the audience, they kind of like embraced me, you know, and I, I didn't have. Right. So I didn't know what the politics were between them. But Lou, you know, had to be in control, you know, and uh, maybe sure. that led to uh, whatever right. they're separating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it, what was, what is John Cale like? We get an idea of, of Lou from so much, but we don't, I don't know what was John Cale as far as a subject for you. Cause he, he also, by the way, we can mention that he was contrib he was participated in the Velvet Under Todd's in your film the under right. the Velvet Underground, uh, which is kind of what we're here to talk about too. And then, right. so what was your what was John Cale as far as being uh, uh, somebody who talked about the Velvet Underground and his relationship with Lou and the music? What was that? What was that man? Well, I I I think what he says is there. You know, again, as uh, another artist, uh, a filmmaker, I was there to, rec to, to implement what their music was, you know, to record and shoot their music. I didn't get into all that other stuff. I know. I didn't have to. Uh, but I think John is so forthright in Todd's film that you understand. He, he, I think he sets the landscape of how Lou had a falling out with John and how we had a falling out with Andy. And, you know, I mean, I think Lou made these kind of choices because whatever his own frustrations were or not, then maybe how he uh, used other people to, for what he felt was, not working for him, but right. uh, we, I, we, you get a feeling that that maybe wasn't really the case, you know, that this was something that Lou felt, but you know, that's all s subjective. I have no course, right. information to say that, you know, I understand, I, you know, is, but are this you is... actually recording this live now? No, it's not live. Oh, 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 oh sorry. <laughs> and if, I, oh, I, which, which bet, which does then suggest, uh, you know, I can mention then, based on what you just asked me, if after the fact there's something that you want me to take out, just let me know. If there's something, because oh. I sometimes will, you know, things come up. It happens. No, no, I, 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 no, I, I know. I don't want to pay. Last time you were trashing Todd and Christine, and I took it oh. out because I just. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. No, uh, I can't. I, the one uh, thing I would like to say is the approach. You know, I had a small part in, I feel, in the Velvet Underground documentary. I shot the interviews, all right? All right. So what, one thing that Todd said to help them is that I knew a lot of the people. So they felt comfortable around that I was there filming them, was, which was great. But the other thing was, on a stylistic level, we definitely looked at, and it, they're in the film, the... Mm -hmm. Uh, screen test that Andy would do, where he would have people sit in front of his Bolex, yeah. not blink, and he right. would just shoot their, like a still image, you know, about, you know, he was always experimenting with time and duration and, and yep. um, what film could be, you know, as kind of uncovering the, uh, uh, what's underneath something, you know, like, you know, sustaining uh, an image. Well, so, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no. So I'm just saying, so the screen test was a reference, but he shot those in black and white. And then the other reference for, for us was Andy Warhol's screen, um, screen, uh, you know, his printed screen uh, uh, printing that he did of, you know, <laughs> The movie stars and Debbie Harry and Jacqueline O'Neill. Silk screen. The silk screen printing. Yeah, that right. He did or yeah. like the photo. So that 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 informed, you know, using those colored backgrounds 
and even gelling their faces with the colors that were close to the background. So that there was a combination of the screen test and the printed uh, screen, the screen, the printed, why am I forgetting what? The printed screen, the silk screen printing uh, uh, all right. I that Warhol you. was famous for yeah. that, that inform the the interviews got you i understand but you said in a couple of minutes ago that 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 todd wanted to use you for uh, uh because you had a, a long history with uh, many of the people that were there when the velvet underground uh which is again the subject of the new film uh right. when they were coming up and you know going through this period and but but i i mean you're you have a long relationship with todd I don't know how many collaborations you had with them, but there've been many. Yeah. I and, know. and I wonder if, uh, who, which came first, the chicken. I mean, it, it, it was that part of why Todd chose to make this film in the first place? Because. No, had, no, no, no. He, I mean, is no, it a coincidence? No, no. I think he was just always taken by this time period in New York and the, yeah. what the cultural, uh, landscape was that came uh -huh. out of the, not only their music, but also the imagery of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, Todd, Todd says, you know, if I quote him right, that the 5,000 records they sold, what, what, it was more important, the 5,000, it started 5,000 different bands that the, that the Velvets were so influential to others to create their own kind of music mm -hmm. band, that, and and you know that he was, was so interested in the culture of the sixties and seventies. Right. Well, we know from his other works, but 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 yeah. all of them from 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 the Bowie, Erzatz yeah. Bowie film, uh, Velvet. Villain. Yeah, the Velvet Gold Mine. Velvet Gold Mine. Thank you. My, see, I just went into a blank. Uh, and the Karen Carpenter. You got the Dylan film. I mean, it, right. it's. But they've all been variations of fiction. Yeah, but but interesting. This somebody is a documentary. Up, yeah, but this is what's interesting. Somebody brought this up. That in his fictions, he he creates an authenticity of the world that allows the viewer to believe what you're seeing as a fiction. Where in his new evolution of making this documentary, he uses elements to create abstractions to kind of create the gestalt, the mood, the feeling of what it was like to be there. Because there wasn't a lot of footage of actually performance footage of the velvet, even though it's strange, they were around all these image makers and nobody was actually recording them in their concerts. So this again allowed, it's always sometimes the weakness is the strength in, in how you approach sure. the subject matter. Yeah. So by him using all these images and filmmakers of the time and the use of pop art and the, the sensibility of how to create a work, I think situates the world and people were there or not there, get a real feeling of who the Velvet Underground were and what their yeah. importance were. Well, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, by the way, it's on the Apple streaming service or will be, um, it's right, it premiered to Cannes, it's just had its screenings at the New York Film Festival or is going to no it has it has okay thank yes. you um uh, and then uh and and then again it will be on the apple tv screening uh streaming service excuse me um and um yeah uh, one of the uh, well i first of all i really appreciate i like how we introduced the key people i like the how they were almost like chapters i really enjoyed how that was framed, but I also it was it was really cool to hear Jonathan Richmond's story. And I've always been a big fan of Jonathan Richmond. And I just thought, how could these two have a deep connection? Like, because right. Jonathan Richmond does something so utterly to me on the surface, and it's always about well getting beyond the surface, right? That's what the film right. can 
help do is lead you to a place that is below the surface. So you may think Jonathan Richmond, this quirky singer songwriter from Boston, what does he possibly have in common with Lou Reed or, or which was the, was he more? Jackson. Well, I Jackson say, Brown Jackson and Jackson Brown. Brown. And I that's mean, even I more, know, right? I was like really that's from true. left field. That's true. Here's this Southern California kid, you, you know, right. Right, writing like singer songwriter couldn't be if anything you think my god lou would have disdained what jackson brown was doing these uh interpers these personal love stories and whatnot but you then you didn't see the the nico connection and and you understand right right, right. You and of course she covered that. one of his big hits of course right but you, yeah, you see how all these people came out of the energy and the creative juices of that time period. Sure, right. And temporarily sucked into this orbit around the Velvet Underground, right? Right. Um, so did you find it to be, um, how was that it, it, talking to those folks for you? How was, uh, and where, how did you handle that? Did you have to because uh, you know you're shooting these, I imagine, under the veil of COVID, right? Yeah. Some... Well, I, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. Certainly, some of them were under COVID, but some of them were actually shot before. Uh, okay. COVID. Um, no, it was just you know I've shot interviews my whole life, and and. Yeah with musicians it was a very open you know were, actually i actually i did make a decision that the camera had a certain distance to them so it was more about the conversation between um todd and the who who the interviewer and interviewee and um I put the Todd very close to the lens. Okay. I always, I always like that the eye line is close to the lens. I always think it's a little distracting when people look way off left or right. Um, mm -hmm. But so I wanted it to be this conversational piece and not have them feel, you know, the camera. But of course, all these people are familiar being around cameras anyway. Um, well, I'm thrilled that I mean, it's great that you have this sort of, you know, journey with with this particular band. It, it, it I like I like that aspect to it. it makes it more special knowing yeah. that you. At the end of my songs for Drella, which yes, I didn't show. I oh actually, yes, talk about that. I bet when you were talking about songs for Drella, I yeah. if you stay if you're getting we're we're going to wind yeah, down, but 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 talk about the promo that you shot. Yeah, Seventeen years earlier, yeah, yeah, in 1990, I shot the promo. We didn't even know what they were then. Video promos for Berlin, Berlin Lou Reed's solo album. Yeah, and I again, I always looked online. I never could find it. And then during the pandemic, I started going through all my boxes, just whatever I could find, old love letters, whatever, photos. And there was a reel, and on that reel, 16 millimeter reel, Amazing. was the Berlin. So Promo I for the album up. and yes. for, on vinyl and tapes <laughs> and yeah. cassette tapes. Exactly. Yeah. Back. Can you tell, just tell the anecdote really quickly, because I think we're going to run out of time, but yeah, just, right. just tell was, a story about Lou Reed and yeah, how you were yeah, going to shoot yeah, yeah. the promo. So I'm setting up the camera, it was 16 millimeter, and Lou came up to me, and at that time, I knew Lou Reed, but not, you know, I was not, didn't know that much about it, and he kicked the tripod which I, I grabbed onto the camera in shock and panic. And he said to me, do it like Andy. And then walked back to the microphone and I like kind of reset up the camera and I didn't say anything to him. So jokingly, when we started Songs for Drell, I said, do you remember when we shot the Berlin promo video? Uh -huh came up and kicked my tripod and said do it like Andy and he looked at me and said 
I don't remember much from back then and smile. <laughs> so and if you see the I, promo, you'll 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 see uh, why maybe he looked like that might be the case back <laughs> in that period. But one of the most prolific and I mean, or to productive, he was very productive. So you know. Uh, Ed, thank you so much, man. Uh, this was a, so exciting to uh, get to talk to you again. You know, I'm a big fan of you and your work. And uh, so, you know, and I'm only sad that I didn't been able to get down to the screenings and run into you at any of the PNI screenings this year, but next year for sure. Well, yeah. And if you want a link to the songs, I, if you, it's Songs Ed for Drella? Yeah. I, no, I no, I have it. Oh, you have no, but you don't have the new version of it, do you? I you don't, don't have the new the version I just authorized that I just read. Yeah, no, I think I do. I think it is. It's what they made available to us. Um, the oh, the right, society, right. oh, the great. film at Lincoln no, Center. Yeah, they they gave you the best one. Yeah, no, they did. It says it. Pretty sure it says it there. And then oh. you have your notes. And then at the right. again, uh, they're going to show the Velvet Underground on Apple TV platform. Uh, currently at the New York Film Festival uh, as we speak. Right. more or less that's what they're going to show and then, and then if enough critics say how wonderful songs are maybe they'll show that as an ad show <laughs> people you should know. see it anybody loves it it's a it's fantastic yeah. thank uh, you I'll ed Hyperion. thank you nice talking to you guys. same here until next time thank you